John Carpenter's The Thing didn't go over well at all when it was released in 1982. Ignored by moviegoers, it was a box office failure. Reviled by critics, it even saw Carpenter being labeled a pornographer of violence by some reviewers. It was such a disappointment for the studio, they took another project away from Carpenter as punishment. But it gradually found its audience, building up a cult following. And soon, a legion of fans and critics alike began calling it one of the greatest horror movies ever made. It didn't take long for The Thing to go from being known as reprehensible trash to being considered an all-time classic. So let's take a look at the making of this classic with a new episode of What the F*** Happened to This Horror Movie. It all goes back to author John W. Campbell, who started writing science fiction stories as a teenager. Several of his stories were published in the pages of Amazing Stories, which earned him the reputation of being a writer of space adventures. So when he started writing stories that weren't space adventures, he used the pen name Don A. Stewart, inspired by the name of his wife, Donna Stewart. Under the Stewart name, he wrote a story that inspired the thing. The story initially had the title Frozen Hell, but after removing the first three chapters and doing some revisions, he decided to call it Who Goes There? Published in the pages of Astounding Magazine, Who Goes There? is said to have been the last significant piece of writing Campbell ever did, and he was only 28 at the time. For the remaining 33 years of his life, he focused on serving as the editor of Astounding Magazine, which he renamed Astounding Science Fiction. Who Goes There tells an incredible story made by the inhabitants of a research outpost in Antarctica. Beneath the snow and ice is a UFO that crashed on the continent long ago, and near the downed vehicle is an alien that emerged from within only to end up frozen in the sub-zero temperatures. The corpse of this alien thing is taken back to the outpost. When it thaws out, it's still alive, and it has the unique ability to perfectly replicate other life forms. Now the people at the outpost can't be sure which of them is still human, and which among them have been assimilated, replaced by the thing. Filmmaker Howard Hawks purchased the film rights to Campbell's story, but it had to be simplified for the adaptation The Thing from Another World, which RKO released in 1951. Produced by Hawks and directed by Christian Nybai, one fan of that film was aspiring director John Carpenter, who first met future producer Stuart Cohen while they were attending film school. He and Carpenter would first discuss the story and the film adaptation in the University of Southern California cafeteria in 1970. Cohen had a dream of someday getting to produce a new adaptation of Who Goes There? Carpenter was so reverent of The Thing from Another World, he at first felt like it should just be left alone. A remake couldn't match up to what Hawks and Nybai had made. But then he began to see the potential of making a more faithful adaptation, a movie that presented the alien thing in the same way Campbell did in his story. As Cohen wrote on his blog, The Original Fan, which is packed with information on the making of The Thing, he loved Who Goes There, because the heart of the story is a locked door murder mystery. Cohen wanted his friend Carpenter to direct the thing, but Universal wasn't open to the idea. Carpenter was a total unknown, years away from making Halloween. He'd only directed Dark Star then and was working on Assault on Precinct 13, so the studio turned to an established horror director, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre's Toby Hooper. The problem was Hooper and his Chainsaw co-writer Kim Henkel were not fans of who goes there. They had no interest in digging into the issues of trust and identity. They didn't want to have to deal with a creature that can assimilate and replace its victims. So Hooper and Henkel moved on and the thing continued making its way through development hell. The producers were having so much trouble getting a satisfactory script, Universal was losing interest in the project. Then Alien was released in 1979 and became a hit for 20th Century Fox proving there was an audience for horror movies about creatures from another world. Universal became enthusiastic about the thing again, and since Carpenter had just had huge success with Halloween, they finally agreed to let Cohen hire his director of choice. Carpenter signed on under the condition that his film would bring the original ideas of Campbell's story to the screen. The alien creature would assimilate people. The characters wouldn't know who among them was a human and who was the thing. He also insisted that the movie would have to include the standout sequence from the story, one where the people at the outpost perform a blood test to find out which one of them has been taken over. 
every bit of the thing is a living being itself. So if a heated wire is stuck into a petri dish of the creature's blood, it will react. Subjecting everyone to this blood test proves to be a very effective way of revealing who has been assimilated. The blood test would end up being one of the most popular scenes in the movie. Carpenter didn't want to write the script himself, so multiple potential writers were considered. Cohen had been a fan of the 1976 comedy The Bad News Bears, so he brought in writer Bill Lancaster. With The Bad News Bears, Lancaster had already proven he was great at writing an ensemble piece, and after reading Who Goes There, Lancaster said he was interested in getting the characters to really play up the paranoia. He had written the perfect cinematic adaptation of the ideas in Campbell's novella. While there were around 40 people at the research outpost in Campbell's story, Lancaster whittled the countdown to just 12, the bare essentials. Since most of the story takes place within the confines of the American outpost, he had been asked to open up the scope in the first half. He did so by adding in another research camp, a Norwegian camp. He wrote that the Norwegians were the ones who discovered the crashed UFO and its frozen passenger. So by the time the Americans get involved, the story is already in progress. They have to catch up and figure out what's going on. Lancaster's script begins with a chase across the vast, snow-covered land of Antarctica, a dog being pursued by a helicopter from the Norwegian camp. The two passengers of the helicopter are acting very strangely, freaking out, firing shots at the dog. When the dog reaches the American outpost, the behavior of the Norwegians gets them killed. One mishandles a grenade, blowing up himself in the helicopter. The other is still armed and is coming off like a threat so one of the Americans shoots him. The dog is taken into the outpost, and a few of the Americans fly off to see what's going on at the Norwegian camp. Nothing's going on there. The place is destroyed. There's no sign of life. But there is the frozen corpse of a human, and the burned corpse of a monstrous creature with human organs. The Americans soon find out that the Norwegians had discovered a crashed UFO, and head out to the crash site to see this vehicle for themselves. Somehow, it's even creepier to see the characters checking out a UFO that has already been unearthed than it would have been to watch them discover it and dig it up. It's also helpful to the story because the discovery and the unearthing of the UFO would have taken up a lot of time. This way, the discovery has already been made and the thing is already on the loose. In fact, it has already infiltrated the American outpost. The Norwegians wanted to destroy that dog because it was an alien creature as the Americans find out when it attacks the sled dogs in the kennel. Now, they know they're dealing with an alien that can assimilate other living beings and replace them. This thing has already assimilated people in their camp, and they have to find out which one of them is a thing. Not just for their own survival, but for the survival of the planet. If the thing makes it to another continent, the entire world population will be assimilated in just three years. Universal was impressed, with Lancaster's script and immediately gave the project a green light. Now Carpenter had to find a cast to bring Lancaster's characters to life. Given that he had just worked with Kurt Russell on Elvis and Escape from New York, you might think that casting Russell in the film was his first decision, but that wasn't the case. Russell was actually the last person to be cast in the film. Dennehy was also a contender for the role of physician Dr. Copper, as was William Daniels, but the role ended up going to Richard Dysart, Thomas Waits was cast as radio operator Sanders, who earned the nickname Windows when Carpenter had Waits put on a pair of glasses. Richard Mauser met about the role of meteorologist Bennings, but was cast as dog handler Clark instead. Bennings was played by Peter Maloney. Joel Polis was cast as assistant biologist Fuchs. Charles Hallahan as geologist Norris. T.K. Carter as Cook Knowles. Carpenter had escaped from New York cast members in mind for the roles of Mechanic Childs and Station Commander Gary. He wanted Isaac Hayes for Childs and Lee Van Cleef for Gary. Having worked with special effects artist Rob Botin on The Fog, Carpenter chose him to handle the effects on The Thing as well. And Botin wanted to do more than just provide the special effects. He wanted an acting role and had his sights set on playing Mechanic Palmer. It was decided that the special effects would be too demanding for Botin to also be able to appear in the film. And since the effects work took so much out of Botin that he ended up being hospitalized with exhaustion, double pneumonia, 
and a bleeding ulcer, that was the right decision. There is also some thought given to casting a comedian as Palmer. Jay Leno, Gary Shandling, and Charles Fleischer were all brought in to meet about the role, but it went to David Clennon, who is neither a comedian nor a special effects artist. With the cast in place and Botine working hard on the special effects, plus Stan Winston assisting with the dog thing effects, filming on the thing began in June of 1981. The first footage shot was the helicopter chasing the dog across the snow, a sequence that was filmed in the Juneau ice field at the border of Alaska and British Columbia while they were at the ice field. The crew also filmed the shot of McReady, Palmer, and Norris exiting the helicopter to approach the UFO crater. None of the actors were present for this shot. Those are crew members wearing the character's winter clothes and protective gear. That might even be Carpenter himself as McReady. The exterior of the American outpost was built in Stewart, British Columbia, which was then considered to be the snowfall capital of the world. But most of the interior scenes were filmed in Los Angeles, on sets that were refrigerated to almost freezing temperatures. Eight weeks of shooting took place on those sets, and much like in the movie itself, there was some tension and paranoia among the cast during this time. Some of the actors didn't feel that Carpenter was communicative enough. Some felt that he was more focused on the monster effects than on their characters. At times, there would be long delays on set while the effects were being prepared. Tired of hearing his co-stars complain so much about the creature effects, Wilford Brimley told them, quote, Don't you guys get it? It's all about the rubber man. Although Brimley was in tune with what the thing was, he was also the only cast member who wasn't required to make the trip up to the exterior sets in Stewart. His character is only seen outside a couple of times, and those shots could be accomplished with a double. A lot of money was saved when Carpenter decided they should only build one outpost in Stewart, as the plan had been to build two, the functional American outpost and the destroyed Norwegian one. But the American outpost gets wrecked over the course of the movie, so Carpenter had the clever idea of having the destroyed American camp double as the Norwegian camp. Not all of the music Morricone provided was used in the movie. Some of the unused tracks were later used for Quentin Tarantino's The Hateful Eight. Carpenter also ended up recording some tracks of his own. Universal was very supportive of the thing at first, and at one point they considered it to be their biggest chance of having a hit in the summer of 1982. They also had Steven Spielberg's E.T. The Extraterrestrial on the schedule, but had been underwhelmed by that one at a studio screening. E.T. was a kid's movie. The Thing was going to draw in the teens and adults. Their attitudes about these films would change substantially once they held test screenings. The test audiences made it clear that E.T. was a heartwarming crowd pleaser, while the bleakness of The Thing was a bummer. Many viewers were disgusted by the violence and the creature effects. There were even walkouts at the test screenings, and the film's ambiguous ending, which shows McCready and Childs sharing a drink out in the cold, and doesn't clearly state whether or not the thing has been successfully destroyed, did not go over well. Some viewers were confused by the ending, others were angered by it. So Universal was stuck with a dark, gross-out horror movie they had lost all enthusiasm for. They poured most of their marketing budget into E.T., which they released on June 11, 1982. Two weeks later, they tossed the thing out into the world on June 25th. Critics tore the film apart, calling it disgusting, depressing, boring, a moron movie, a barf bag movie. They compared it to porn, traffic accidents, train wrecks. A common opinion was that Carpenter had gone too far this time. The Thing is Carpenter's favorite movie of all the films he has made, and to be called a pornographer of violence for making it really hurt him. Even people who were involved with the film reacted poorly to it at first. There was a feeling that Botine's effects overwhelmed everything else in the movie. Visual effects artist Albert Whitlock, whose team provided the matte paintings of the crashed UFO, was offended by the film. Kurt Russell was disappointed that character moments had been cut out in favor of the gross-out creature moments. He felt the ick factor of the film was too high. He would eventually change his view of that, saying, quote, The monster is so insane, it's easy to get past the monster and into the story of paranoia. Fans today are very familiar with the poster art Drew Struzan created for the film. The image of a person in winter clothes, their face obscured by a bright glow. It's the artwork that has always been used to promote the thing. So by now, 
It's thought to be iconic. But when Carpenter first saw it, he hated it, feeling that it made the movie look like a slasher. Good or bad, it didn't draw people in. The general audience didn't turn out to see the movie. The Thing had an opening weekend of $3 million, then lost almost half of its screens in the middle of its second week. It was a disaster. Universal had been working with Carpenter and Lancaster on an adaptation of the Stephen King novel Firestarter. When the numbers came in for The Thing, Carpenter and Lancaster were removed from Firestarter. Carpenter and Cohen were also developing a remake of the 1939 film Only Angels Have Wings at a different studio. That project was cancelled due to the failure of The Thing. Luckily, Carpenter was able to go into production on a different Stephen King adaptation, Christine, just six months after The Thing came and went at theaters. The Thing began gathering a cult following once it reached home video, and with some distance from the release date in the summer of E.T., critics started reassessing the film and giving it more positive write-ups. Its bad reputation was left far behind. Now, it was being seen as a well-crafted film with an excellent script, a masterpiece of building tension and dread, a dazzling showcase of Rob Bottin's genius effects work, one of the greatest horror movies ever made. That's the reputation that has held for decades now. It has been celebrated with multiple special edition DVD and Blu-ray releases, and it's often said that the audio commentary recorded by Carpenter and Russell ranks as one of the best commentaries ever. The thing got so popular, there was talk of follow-ups. Universal attempted to cash in on the title by releasing a prequel with the same name in 2011, and in 2020, it was announced that Universal, Blumhouse, and Carpenter would be teaming up for a reboot of The Thing, another adaptation of Campbell's story, Who Goes There, this time using elements from the frozen hell draft of the manuscript. Whatever the future holds for The Thing, it doesn't seem likely that any further additions to the franchise will be able to match up to what Carpenter, Lancaster, and their collaborators accomplished in 1982. They brought Campbell's concept to the screen in an amazing way. And even though the outpost in the film doesn't function like one would in reality, it has been embraced by the scientific community in Antarctica. At some research stations, it has become tradition to celebrate the beginning of winter with a screening of the thing. The people who attend those screenings get to watch the film under the perfect conditions. Sitting in an outpost in Antarctica, imagining what might happen to them if there really was something monstrous lurking outside, in the dark, beneath the ice. When given the opportunity to revive The Thing for Universal Pictures, producers Mark Abraham and Eric Newman chose to craft a prequel to the 1982 John Carpenter movie. Unfortunately, this new version of The Thing turned out to be a box office disappointment, just like Carpenter's had been. It also managed to disappoint fans of the Carpenter film and the members of its own special effects team when the impressive practical effects that had been put to use on set were completely covered over by unconvincing CGI effects in post-production. There were some interesting decisions made behind the scenes of The Thing 2011, but also some very poor ones. So let's look back 10 years and find out what the f*** happened to this horror movie. The Thing 2011 exists because of Dawn of the Dead 2004. That remake of George A. Romero's 1978 classic was produced by Mark Abraham and Eric Newman, and when Universal Pictures released the film, it earned more than $100 million at the global box office. So it's no surprise Universal wanted to stay in the Abraham-Newman remake business after that. There's conflicting information on how exactly the producers got involved with the new version of The Thing. In some interviews, it was said they chose the project after looking through Universal's library of titles. But on the audio commentary, Newman says Universal brought the project to them and asked them to revive The Thing in some way. Whatever the case, the duo knew very early on that they did not want their take on The Thing to be a remake. They knew there was no way they could make something better than what Carpenter had done. Instead, they decided to make something that could be seen as a complimentary companion to the Carpenter movie. They decided to make a prequel. It's quite interesting they felt The Thing was an untouchable film when they had just produced a remake of Dawn of the Dead, which many horror fans would argue is also an untouchable film. There could have been some extra hesitancy to produce a remake in this case because Carpenter's The Thing had already been a remake itself of 1951's The Thing from Another World. And who wants to say they've made a remake of a remake? 
Then again, since the source material for all of these Thing projects is a 1938 novella written by John W. Campbell, there are some who wouldn't use the term remake for Carpenter's film at all. They would prefer to say that it's another adaptation of the Campbell story, not a remake of The Thing from Another World. I want to thank you guys for watching What the F*** Happened to This Horror Movie and ask that if you enjoy our shows, please subscribe to our channel right now, like this video, and click on the bell so you can be notified each time a new video goes up. And now, back to the show. You don't have to worry about arguing semantics for the 2011 movie. It is a prequel that leads directly into the events of The Carpenter Thing. In the 1982 film, the alien creature arrives, in the form of a dog, at an American outpost in Antarctica after it has already decimated a Norwegian outpost not far away. It has been burned out and appears that everyone is dead. There's a fire axe stuck in the wall, a frozen corpse of a man who slit his own wrists and throat, and nobody else around. Carpenter and screenwriter Bill Lancaster had already set up the prequel very well. Abraham and Newman just had to figure out how to fill in the blanks. Ronald D. Moore, best known for his work in the worlds of Star Trek and Battlestar Galactica, was the first writer hired for The Thing 2011. Moore was the one involved when they had to feel their way through some really bad early ideas. Figuring out who the lead character would be was a challenge, because Russell's performance had been so iconic that they had to be careful not to focus on someone who could be unfavorably compared to him. A male scientist who would have been presented in what they described as a wimpy manner was also out. The decision was made to set the lead apart by making the character female. Since there had not been any female characters in Carpenter's film, this eliminated the problem of a direct comparison. As the development of the thing went on, Moore fulfilled his contract and Eric Heiserer was brought in to work on the script, making this the third high-profile horror franchise he had worked on in a row around this time. Heiserer also wrote Final Destination 5 and the remake of A Nightmare on Elm Street. The rewrite he performed on this project was substantial enough that he is the sole credited writer on the finished film, although Scott Frank was brought on to do an uncredited polish, just as he had done on Dawn of the Dead 2004. And like Zack Snyder, who made his feature directorial debut on Dawn of the Dead, The Thing also marked the feature debut of a director who had been working in commercials and music videos up to that point. Interestingly, Heinengen was only available to make The Thing because the film he had signed on to direct the previous year had fallen apart due to the Great Recession. And that project had been Army of the Dead, the zombie movie that was being produced and co-written by Zack Snyder. Army of the Dead wouldn't end up being made until a decade later, with Snyder at the helm for Netflix. But in 2008, it got very close to happening with Heiningen at Warner Brothers. After Warner decided Army of the Dead was too expensive, Heiningen went looking for another job. Snyder introduced him to Eric Newman, and he got hired for The Thing. The most admirable element of the prequel is the dedication Heiningen, Heiserer, and the crew showed to make sure their film would match up to what Carpenter had shown of the Norwegian camp in his film. Heiserer made sure to show the alien escaping from the block of ice. He shows who put the fire axe into the wall and why. He introduces us to the man who will end up slashing his wrist and throat. Still frames from the movie, along with maps that were already available online, were used to recreate the layout of the Norwegian camp as shown in 1982. With the height of Kurt Russell and how he looked in the rooms, he passed through being used as a guide for the construction of the rooms in the 2011 movie. The effort to match up the earlier film extended to a shooting location, as some of the snowy exteriors were filmed in Cumberland, British Columbia, not far from where the cast and crew of the 82 film had been set up in Stewart, BC. But while Carpenter was blessed with the opportunity of having his outpost set built in true isolation in an area of Alaska that was about a 30-mile drive from Stewart, the prequel had to stay closer to civilization. The outpost for this one was built in a mine pit near Toronto, Ontario. Only half of the characters who populate the outpost in the film are Norwegian, because of course Universal wasn't going to release a film that was entirely populated by Norwegians speaking their first language. The eight Norwegians are joined by Danish, English, and French characters, plus five Americans including the lead. Since the characters are from all over the place, they default into speaking English with each other, and only one person at the outpost doesn't speak English. The lead is Kate Lloyd, a vertebrate paleontologist who is brought to the outpost by antagonistic scientist Dr. Sander Halvorsen after the discovery of the spacecraft and the frozen alien. Played by Mary Elizabeth Winstead, she's not only the audience surrogate character that we follow through this crazy situation, she's also the most observant and sensible person of the bunch, and turns out to be a capable heroine. The casting of Helvorsen was one of the bigger issues to arise during production, as Norwegian actor Dennis Storhoy, who was initially hired to play the role, was replaced by Danish actor Ulrich Thompson after a week of filming. 
Some sources say Storhoy was fired due to personal issues, while Storhoy himself said that he chose to leave the production. This switch-up required some digital effects work in post, as Thompson's face was put on Storhoy's body for scenes that had already been shot with the other actor. Although The Thing 2011 turned out to be a decent film, and the material was certainly handled with respect, the film does come up short in comparison to The Carpenter Thing in the way the producers always seem to know it would. That's why they made it a prequel instead of a remake in the first place. The writing isn't as good as the script Bill Lancaster wrote for the Carpenter movie. It can't achieve the level of suspense and paranoia the 82 film had, and instead of building a feeling of dread, it increases the amount of action, showing off alien attack sequences that aren't as impressive as what Carpenter showed nearly 30 years earlier. But the prequel's greatest downfall is its presentation of the alien. The film was following, or technically leading into, a movie that is filled with some of the most awe-inspiring practical effects ever put on film. The work Rob Bottin did on The Thing was incredible. During the production of the prequel, the correct decision was made to have the effects artist from Amalgamated Dynamics on set to bring the monstrous alien shapeshifter to life through practical effects. There was always the thought in mind that the creature would receive slight CG enhancements in post, but as the movie was being filmed, the actors had the opportunity to interact with animatronic monsters. Sadly, the studio ended up deciding that the practical effects needed to be completely covered up with a layer of CGI, and they apparently made this decision after some misguided audience members at test screenings made negative comments about the effects. The designs created by Amalgamated Dynamics remained. The animatronics and puppets were just replaced by CGI versions of the exact same creature. So it was like the effects artists never needed to be on set at all. Effects supervisor Alec Gillis was so depressed to see all of their practical work tossed aside, he wrote and directed his own creature feature called Harbinger Down a few years later as a way to try to get over the disappointment of the thing. For his part, Heinengen seemed quite willing to have the practical effects replaced by CGI effects. On the commentary, he and Newman said the replacement was necessary because the effects team didn't have enough prep time. Botine had a year to work on the effects for the previous thing, they said, while Amalgamated Dynamics only had a few months to get ready for this one. Heinengen said the creatures required more articulation than the puppets had, that they couldn't do much with the practical stuff. In one interview, he even said the practical effects made The Thing 2011 look like an 80s movie. And he said this as a negative, even though the film is set in the 80s, and its entire purpose was to emulate an 80s classic. He felt the CGI effects made the film more accessible to the modern audience. Universal also demanded the end of the film be reshot. The original cut involved Kate entering the spacecraft to find the corpses of multiple aliens that had died from their contact with the Thing. She was then attacked by the Thing in the form of an alien that had no human element to it at all, meant to be a copy of the spaceship's pilot. The studio didn't like that, and viewers in the test screenings were reportedly confused. They didn't know what this creature was supposed to be. Since Kate and Halvorsen had been butting heads throughout the movie, Universal wanted the final creature she encounters to have Halvorsen's face on it. So in the version of the film that was released, Kate's climatic confrontation is with the Halvorsen monster, which Heinegan admits looks like it was created at the last minute, since it was. CG enhancements were also added to the interior of the spaceship to cover up the alien corpses, which were taken out of the movie entirely. All of this tinkering was done in an attempt to turn The Thing 2011 into more of a crowd pleaser, but it didn't do much good in the long run. The general audience didn't seem to be very interested in this project. Made on a budget of $38 million, it earned just 31.5 at the global box office. The failure of The Thing 2011 shouldn't be put on the shoulders of Heinengen. His work here is effective enough and shows enough promise that it should have led to more feature work. But nine years would pass before the director made another movie. This may have been his own choice. Unsourced online trivia claims that he found working on The Thing to be a negative experience due to studio interference. So he has purposely avoided working with Hollywood Studios since then. His 2020 film, The Forgotten Battle, was a Dutch and Belgian production. If Heinengen was disenchanted by his experience working on The Thing, he is a great Grin and Barrett team player because there is no hint of disappointment in the press he did for the film at the time of its release or on the audio commentary. However Heinengen felt about his film at the end of the day, it has gained some fans over the years. Still, a lot of viewers who enjoy it in its current state would like to see the movie the way it was before all the CG editions and before the ending was reshot. There have been release the amalgamated dynamics cut and release the pilot version movements, but Universal doesn't seem to be paying attention yet. 10 years have gone by, but there's still hope that someday we'll get a special edition release that will remove the CGI from those monsters the effects team brought to the set. 